the mentality of, of those guys that went there. And, and like, I thought it was super cool. Um, the one guy that it was his first bolt action rifle wanted to get into hunting. And the first thing he did was sign up for a class. Mm-hmm. Like that, that was pretty cool. I think I know you're talking about, uh, he, he had a 300 win mag. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. And every time he hit like a personal record, yep. because that was the first time that he had shot past like two or 300 yards. Yeah. Yeah. He would be like, Hey, what's up, guys? Phil Valeo here with the Modern Day Cyber Podcast, and welcome to episode 83. And in this episode, I've got my good friend Clayton Creel on the podcast, and Clayton is the gentleman who helped me with my elk hunt back in 2021 and has been a good friend ever since um, actually reaching out to me uh, with interest for attending our uh, sniper course that we do for MSTOA, which is Montana State Tactical Officers Association. And so we met through that vine and, um, he's just been an awesome, awesome human being. Um, and it's cool to talk about this podcast from the sense of a hunter. I look up to him, uh, in the sense of being that backcountry hunter born and bred in Wyoming and just seeing him kind of change his mindset of wanting to continue to hone his skills as a rifleman. Uh, cause that's very rare to see with uh, experienced hunters, um, if that makes sense. And so. Uh, this year was, um, or this podcast talks about setting goals and what kind of matches he wants to attend. And in between those matches, what he plans on doing in terms of training, type of drills, craft challenge. And um, at the very end of the episode, we talk about uh, his seven PRC built that he built for this year. And so hopefully you enjoy this podcast. If you're a hunter, I know that you're going to get a lot out of this podcast. But other than that, um, if you are listening to this, we also will be uploading a YouTube video of the podcast. And that's something that we want to do a little bit more is have a video podcast up on YouTube. So check that out as well. If you want to kind of see uh, Clayton and I um, talk uh, to each other during the podcast. So thanks for listening, guys. Appreciate you and enjoy the episode. Finally. Man, that took, what, 25, 30 minutes? A while. I think because <laughs> it was my first time uh, setting up, um, just trying to figure out how I wanted to lay out everything. And again, it's not perfect right now at the moment. Uh, so we are recording live from my studio, a podcast with my good friend, Clayton Creel. Clayton's been on our podcast uh, a few times. Um, we talked about my elk think, hunt. Or was that I the think only that time? Was, I think that was the only time. Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, well, you've been on uh, several of our videos uh, for the Modern Day Rifleman Network. Yeah, yeah. Helped me out a, a ton with that. Uh, so that's always helpful. And um, yeah, dude, what have you been up to? Uh, Besides uh, slaving, slaving around. Oh, <laughs> <for, yeah. laughs> uh, not a lot. Just work, uh, life, trying to make it back to jujitsu, yeah. and uh, been making it occasionally. Yeah. So but. one thing. Uh, don't forget to do is because these are the way the mics work mm. is you want to make sure you, you talk as close to because the further you get yeah, away, yeah. Okay. Uh, the lighter it's going to sound. So gotcha. Um, yeah. No, yeah. Thanks for having me on. I'm just bummed. I forgot the bear claws and this one's recorded <laughs> video recorded, I guess. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to start doing for modern day sniper is start doing more video podcasts. Um, mm-hmm. so that, uh, we can just again push more content out there. Mm-hmm. I think uh, you know video podcasts is important to be able to for them to see our facial expressions and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. I know it sucks, especially for Kalen and I because we are uh, not with each other. Um, yeah. So like editing two videos, it's hard into. But hopefully with you know um, Ryan coming mm-hmm. on board, him coming out to Wyoming, we're able to do more frequent podcasts between him and I or you and I. Mm-hmm. Um, I talked to uh, having Mike bring Mike on oh, talking yeah. about his, his kind of his job. But, um, dude, oh, know what we cool. talked about, um, before the podcast is podcast ideas of mm. what you wanted to talk about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you mentioned to me last night that you'd wanted to go over some goals and, uh, but like last week, it's funny that you asked me cause last week I was like scratching out some just thoughts I had in my head and it was kind of, uh, based around, hunting and law enforcement and then my shooting goals for the year kind of encompass or or for both I guess but I definitely want to like I told you shoot more volume you've been helping me out with reloading stuff and so I can finally reload 
quick enough that I can, and I think I'm set up for the next two barrels probably uh, for my six and uh, 308. So definitely want to shoot a lot more, just get more, um, you know, reload, say 500 rounds at a time and, yeah. and get a higher volume of shooting, yeah. <laughs> I guess. Um, and then like competition, obviously I, I want to do a uh, trout and NRL hunter and uh, obviously any local club PRS type matches. Um, and while PRS, I definitely think is better for more practical for hunters or law enforcement field shooting conditions. I really want to try my hand at F class too, because I know it's, you know, it's, it's, you're kind of eliminating the positional stuff and I won't say you're eliminating field conditions, but you're, you're shooting positions, obviously more stable from yeah. prone, but yeah. it kind of isolates. I think it'd just be fun to isolate the ammo trigger press and ability to read wind for yeah. like for a group. Yeah. So, um, wanted to try out one of those and then, uh, yeah, those are, I mean, that's pretty much my goals. I wanted to do the craft challenge once a month this year. Uh, trying to remember which i think it could have been the just f and send it podcast yeah. that where he had chris way on yeah and uh the more i think about that i mean it's just a really good baseline for yeah. um knowing your abilities so if you have a you know if you miss a shot in competition or just out practicing like i know like okay if i average this um i think it, it just it shows me what my ability is and whether if it's a miss whether that was my ability to rewind or um if it's a problem with the rifle i guess you know one thing that uh chris wade does a really great job at is is um gathering data and analyzing it. Mm -hmm. excuse me um but you know one thing the same goals align with with you in respect to you know more volume um at home training versus like going out to competition. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've talked like, I'm not going to try to pursue competing at the highest level mm -hmm. for the next few years. Cause, mm -hmm. uh, a, I know what it takes to, to, to be at that level and B, I don't have the commitment, um, to be able to do that because I want to be able to spend more time with my daughter and, yeah. and focus on the things that, that she wants to do. Yep. And so, uh, with that, I want to still be able to maintain my skill sets as a competitive shooter, as an instructor. Um, but one of the things that I definitely want to have a better understanding with is gathering that data. So like you said, it's like, hey, you know, in, in 10 to 15 mile an hour wind conditions, I'm a 60% shooter, right? Mm -hmm. My ability to call wind down to X mile an hour for this specific cartridge, you know, and, and um, I think my goals with... Uh, Maybe not shooting an F class match, but mm -hmm. being able to reload like an F class shooter, like Eric yeah, Cortina, yeah. you know, because, yep. you know, one of the things that I've been struggling with lately is my hand, like having confidence in my hand loads. Yeah. Right. And, and like, is, is like wondering if, you know, um, the deviation I see downrange is as a result of me yeah. or is it my, is it my barrel? or my load, right? Because, um, not I should say my barrel, but my load in general, mm -hmm. because I definitely, uh, last year for the 2022 season, I definitely uh, went into matches uh, kind of with a rifle that I wasn't confident with, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And that plays a huge, huge thing uh, once you start getting to those higher echelon levels of competition, mm -hmm. you know, because Caitlin and I preach, like, I mean, you can show up with factory ammo and do well. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's true. Right. But when you start getting to those higher levels of like mm -hmm. top 10, top 20 finishes consistently. Yeah. Your bullets have to go exactly where you want them to go. Yeah. Like if your ammo's not consistent, I mean, that can take, say, five to 30 points or whatever. But in one point at your level of shooting, you know, takes you back quite a ways. I don't know if Phil's going to edit this out or not. He just had to run upstairs to. Don't worry. I didn't say anything inappropriate that you'll have to edit out. <laughs> Sorry for the, uh, the interruption there. No. Uh, yeah, like a couple, uh, 
you know, a couple points at the level that you shoot at can separate, you know, first from 10th to 50th to 100th, yeah. you know, place. So I would say the level that something. I used to shoot at because, I mean, if you look at my track record last oh, year. Oh, you just, it? you had one bad match. Oh, like I, I, had I, like I told bad, you. I had a lot of bad matches. So. Okay. Well, I still like the, the I still say that level because, um, so like the PRS finale from what I understand, and I'm not, uh, I haven't even done it. You know, for the listeners, I haven't done a national level PRS match. I've just done local ones. But the way I look at it is from what you told me, it's like what the top 300 guys that get invited. So, like, in my mind, if you're even invited to go to that, you're no matter how you place, you're, you know, one of the top 300 shooters yeah. in the country. Yeah. And with especially with how big the sport's like blown up from what you've been telling me, um, I don't know any of the numbers, but. Mm-hmm say top 300 out of 10,000. I don't know if that's, but that's still, you're still a top level shooter. Yeah. Well, I appreciate like, top, that. top 1% in the, in the country. Um, well, the thing that I really wanted for you to talk about this podcast is, is like how you feel like you want to document your journey, right? Because yeah. again, we're all, um, in different skill set wise, mm-hmm. and we all have different trajectories of and goals of what yeah. we want to accomplish by, you know, December thirty first of twenty twenty three. Yeah, I, I think that's very, you know, uh, societal of yeah. like of like, hey, like you know, I want to be able to do this this year, which is you know, yeah. good guide guiding features. Um, but like, how do you feel like? you're going to organize your your time or your your practice sessions your training sessions Mm -hmm. that allow you to accomplish your goals by december 31st when Mm -hmm. it comes to you know um honing your craft as a rifleman right because like yeah yeah, yeah. you know for for hunters right like you know again by hunter like their success Mm -hmm. is being able to uh you know when the time comes and they get their chance to shoot to, mm-hmm. to not to shoot not miss yep and, and put that animal down yeah right? yeah whereas like i think you've evolved from that step of being a being a hunter mm-hmm. like you know in in more or less now wanting to be a more well-rounded rifleman yeah yeah right no that's yeah i, see, I think i see what you're saying and that's one reason like you you're mentioning how do i want to document and measure that um that's where the craft challenge comes in because in in my mind like we went out that one day and i shot the craft challenge with the was going from like 13 to 20 mile an hour the wind was just super gusty and i didn't do all that great but that shows me i think it was like two and a half inches or something with that one flyer and it shows me that hey if i'm going to shoot at an animal in those conditions like i only have a, a two and a half moa certainty you know, so I've got to get close enough to, and I always try to get closer anyways, but at, at a maximum, I need to be, so to say, uh, I'm aiming for a 10 inch area on the animal, depending on how they're standing, what shot they're presenting me with. And I'm shooting in those conditions, uh, take 10 divided by two and a half, whatever that comes out to in hundreds of yards. That's the distance that the farthest distance that I should be shooting in those conditions. So if I go out on a nice day, no wind, and I shoot one MOA um, during the craft challenge, so standing, kneeling, sitting prone, I know under those conditions I'm a one MOA shooter, so I would never shoot at an animal at 1,000 yards, but I know I could, if that makes sense. So that I think the craft challenge gives a good documentation of – my shooting ability under those uh, various conditions, yeah, you know. Um, well, so I, I, you know, not to not to interrupt you, but mm-hmm. you know, one thing that um, I guess that I that I like think about when I when I think about the crap challenge or all these other different shooting drills, it's like going to it's like going to work out, right? Yeah. You know, when when you go to work out. And let's say you stick to the same exact routine of like, hey, on chest day, I'm doing bench press first, yeah. followed by dumbbells, followed by a fly, and then yeah. whatever, right? You do that sequential order. Yeah. Well, yeah. eventually your muscles are going to 
get used to it. Yeah, right? you're going to get you, good at that one thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, I'm always a fan of like varying your skill sets through yeah. a numerous round of drills. And I think that's why I like competition because, yeah, yeah. You, maybe you go to a competition and you do the PRS barricade, whatever. But sometimes you'll always find like one or two training uh, or um, events yeah. that like yep. really test a skill that you, you didn't even think of, right? Like yeah. uh, holding over or um, uh, again, multiple targets from two different positions yep. and you know, you're doing a, a, a elevation and a windage hold. Right? Yeah. When are you going to ever use that in a, in a hunting situation? Maybe for coyotes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, when you're, when you've got uh, a multiple threat engagement <laughs> type of scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, there's always good to be like, Hey, okay. Hey, I'm going to do the craft, you know, every month. But in between the craft, I'm going to be doing X, Y, Z that ultimately leads back to getting better at the craft challenge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So like for me, I guess the craft would be a measurement, but that's why I want to go, you know, do the competitions. And, you know, me, I like to go up in the hills and shoot at random rocks. Yeah. So like I'm learning by doing the competition, shooting for fun, yada, yada, yada. The craft is just a, that measurement that I can track, I yeah. guess. Um because, you know, how I place at a match could depend on who else is there and how mm. good they shot. Yeah. Um, so for me, that cra the craft would just be a measurement. But um, all the other stuff I plan on doing, I mean, I've got a ton of stuff going on with the the PRC, mm. the 7 PRC. Um, loving it so far. And uh, really, confidence with ammo, too. Like, you talked about this earlier, uh, brought this up, and I didn't plan on going this route, but the way I'm going to do load development, um, I'm going to document that and put it in the network for when I get around to doing it for the, the seven PRC should be loading tomorrow. Um, Hornady's sample size thing really hit home with me. And, mm -hmm. and, um, I think I, I might've maybe heard it different than other people. Uh, but like, I can't tell you how many times I've like chased my tail going off of, you know, I shoot a bug hole three shot group. And so I zero the scope off of that. And then the next day I go out and say it's a half inch, three quarter uh, inch group. But the center of that group is like a half inch to the right now. And I'm yeah. like, shoot, did my scope get bumped? Yeah. Um, so one thing, no matter what I do for the load development and how my load development changes over the years, I'm definitely going to do uh, 20 shots at the end of it. So whatever load I settle on. Um, and it's going to be bigger than a three shot group, more than likely. Uh, but I'm going to zero my scope for the center of that group because it's going to show me a better idea of what the dispersion is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I've already been doing a bunch of 10 shotters and uh, I did a couple 15 shotters. Yeah. And so if I zero off that, I know like, okay, it's, it's a one inch 20 shot group. If I, you know, zero in the center of that, I know I'm going to be, my bullet could hit somewhere, uh, within a half minute of the center of my reticle. Yeah. If that makes sense. And so that would, that's going to give me confidence kind of going back to what you were saying. If you shoot a 20 shot group with one of your rifles, um, and you zero off of that and you know, it's a, whatever it ends up being three quarter inches, half inch, whatever it ends up being for 20 shots. And then you go to a match, like having that confidence to know, like, I know the rifle's capable of this because I shot a big enough group. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like uh, uh, Jaden Quinlan was saying about with hunting rifles, that's mm -hmm. kind of how I plan to do it with the 7 PRC is I'm going to shoot three shots, let the barrel cool, shoot three shots. And if I don't finish, I uh, want to go up to at least 20, obviously. If I don't finish it all that day, I might, you know, save save it for a different day or whatever. But one of my goals is to basically shoot – to give a visual representation of, I think, what they said or how I heard it was shoot, instead of at the same target, shoot, say, seven different triangles. I'm shooting for the tip of the triangle. Mm -hmm. And then looking at those three-shot groups and, and finding an average for the three-shot yeah. and say it's – so for five-shotters, my I was going to put this in the – network so this will be a little bit of a spoiler for my average five shot group with the load that i was using to break in the barrel uh was 0. 0.7 for 
a five shot group, and that was with four five shot groups. It averaged point seven. It was like as bad as point eight and as good as point five. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I get around to making a specific load for it, um, I'm going to shoot five to or sorry seven seven three shot groups. See what the average for those three shot groups is, and um, but then I want to do it on like wax paper or something so I can overlay the groups like get the triangles lined up and then show like how much, yeah, I shot some one or two quarter inch groups, but when you stack them on top of each other, like this quarter inch group was a little to the left, this yeah, one was a little to the right. Yeah. And that'll give me an idea of the actual, uh, dispersion of where the rifle's going to hit. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, I, I've loved the stuff coming out from Hornady. So huge shout out to those guys. It's yeah. kind of changed the way I think about load development. Yep. So I'm excited to do that, kind of show you the results, put the results in the network. And then, um, I don't know, maybe that, that could be something like, I'm sure some of your rifles shoot some kick butt 20 shot groups. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you might have to do that one of these days, just go and go and shoot a 20 shot group. I do have to finish off some uh, 647, 110 a tips. So mm-hmm. maybe I can see how well my load was. That was what I used for the AG cup. Yeah. Um, I loaded like 400 rounds, but I didn't make it past day two because yep. you have to you have to essentially shoot your way to day three, oh, right? Okay. And then day three is like another 120, 120, 130 rounds. Okay. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't make it that that far, so I've got a bunch of ammo saved up. So gotcha. You know, I could definitely use that and and shoot, you know, uh, those 20 shot groups, but doing it in a manner like you said, hey, shoot three or seven three shot groups yeah 21 rounds right yeah um over seven different triangles um or you know um uh, point aims yeah right? um that i'm assuming will probably all be on like i think it, visually for me it'd be nice if they were all in the same row yeah kind of like low development right yep. is in terms of like seeing that uh vertical dispersion yeah yeah um but yeah how do you like in that seven PRC? Talk to us about it. I know we've talked we've, we've talked about it already <laughs> yeah. in many different uh, forms of you coming over during uh, the earlier part of winter, doing some video stuff on it for mm-hmm. our C- Circle of Components Masterclass, and uh, talking about you know why you chose specific parts to that uh, rifle setup. But yeah. I just want you to give a brief a summary of again your experience of hunting out here in, mm. in Wyoming as a, uh, a born and bred backcountry hunter, mm. um, you know, like living in the mountains with a Jansport backpack, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, why you ended up with the 7 PRC, considering it's a fairly new cartridge, yeah. right? And, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess the quick version was would be that I started out with a 7 millimeter Remington Magnum. That was my first uh, hunting rifle when I bought my own. I started started hunting with my dad's rifle as a 7 STW. But uh, bought a 7 mag, and then I moved. I ended up moving away from that for a while. You know, I thought a little more thump can't hurt, and I was kind of doing it on paper. So 300 Win Mag had a little more knockdown with the 200 grain uh, ELDX. So I shot that for a while, um, and then I went 28 Nosler because, well, I went back to 7 Mag because I was like, I don't see a killing difference when I put the shots where they're supposed to be between the 7 Mag and the 300, but the 7 Mag bucks wind a little better. Then, with the bullets I was using, obviously different loads can vary. Um, And then I thought, well, the 7 bucks wind really good. I'm going to find, like, the highest ballistic coefficient highest sectional density bullet and then find the cartridge that launches that the fastest and at the time it was the the bullet that i found was the 195 uh burger elite hunter um then the 180 eldm came out and that was even even higher um but it's kind of a side tangent i did did we talk about last time my experiences with burgers I'll just skip over that and say I don't hunt with burgers anymore. But uh, <laughs> so went the 28 Nozzle route for a while, and uh, it's a great – it's a kick-butt cartridge. It is a like, kick-butt cartridge. But uh, it is – like it's it's hard on barrels, and I could, I could sacrifice barrel life for performance for a hunting rifle. But 
it was also it was just finicky um and super super expensive to shoot uh and i just was like do i really need this over a seven mag so like last year i hunted primarily with my went back to the seven mag again and then that barrel was just about shot out and the seven prc came out and basically uh i was like looking at the numbers it's pretty much what they say it's just a more modern designed Mm -hmm. uh seven mag and so i'm like the seven mag is always going to have a a place in my heart it's my favorite cartridge but the the prc is basically that just um wanted to try kind of something new and um how much does it weigh so it's 13 pounds right now i was shooting for between 11 and 12 so I might change a couple things before hunting season. I think I'm going to leave it alone for uh, throughout the summer. Maybe use it as is for a yeah. NRL hunter yeah. um, or any classes that I can um, go with you to and, yeah. and stuff. But uh, is that is I'm that like, is that heavy? Thirteen pounds? No. So <laughs> and the reason why I, I I say that is because <laughs> you know um, you know we recently released the Modern Day Hunter uh, in collaboration with Short Action Customs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my gunsmith that I've had for over uh, seven years now, and um, excluding my two-year stint at Gunworks. Um, anyways, uh, so those rifles, the short action or long action, is anywhere from uh, 11 to 12 pounds with bipods and whatever optic that yeah. you decide to throw on top of it. And, um, you know, people are like, like, I wouldn't carry that in mountains. You know? and, and I get it, right? It's like, it's definitely not a sheep gun. Right, but you know, I've definitely carried a twelve pound gun in the mountains yeah. with no issues. Yeah. Because I always go back to the point of like like hey, you have to shoot it. Yeah. Right? Like you have to shoot, you have to train with a gun that's tolerable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When you when you start going to those super light frames that have a bunch of recoil, you're not gonna wanna shoot it. Yeah, you're not gonna wanna practice with yeah. it and you can't manage recoil as yeah. good and yeah. Which is one thing with the 300 and the the 28 nozzler. Like, after getting trained up by you guys, uh, I really like spotting my impacts, <laughs> and I also like hunting with a suppressor. Now that I have a suppressor, so uh, the 28 nozzler with the suppressor on it, I couldn't get back on recover from recoil and get back on target uh, inside of like 750, 600, 750 somewhere in there with the suppressor now with the muzzle brake uh i think i could on a 300 yard plate i mean it would my reticle just be settling down in time to see the plate start to swing but like right at the impact versus the the 7 prc there's definitely a difference less kick i can spot things a little closer um but as far as the rifle weight like I hate to be that guy, but there's a lot of out of shape people and I'd rather have, like you said, when the time comes, like the, you've got to be able to accurately shoot. And in my mind, that happy balance for me is 11 to 12 pounds yeah. with a Magnum. You know, if, it, if my hunting rifle is a six creed, I might get away with an eight or nine pound. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, with a Magnum, I think that 11 to 12 is kind of a sweet spot, but 13 doesn't really hurt my feelings because that 300 win mag I talked about, I forget what it weighed. It is a tank. It yeah. I had my US Optics, the ER25 on it. It was on a Kimber action with a like medium Palma 28-inch Pacnor barrel, yeah. and uh, it was freaking heavy. I want to say it was over 16 pounds for sure. I don't remember the exact weight, yeah. and I carried that all over. Yeah. Granted... As I saw last year, I'm a little more out of shape than I used to be. <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, those little, those little legs can move, though. <laughs> Thanks. Up, up some but, hills, up some well, mountains. Yeah, now we gotta we gotta stay hiking this summer, stay legged up. But uh, no, that <clears throat> like I'd rather have a, a shootable rifle and go light, like lose weight in other places. Like I can take lighter food lighter tent, lighter sleeping bag, lighter backpack. Like I'll shave weight in other places so that when the the time comes, like somebody wrote or said something, it might might have been on a podcast. Heck, it might have even been you guys. I don't know. But someone said the bullet is like 
the only thing you have to touch the animal that actually touches the animal when you're hunting, yeah. right? Or your arrow if you're hunting with a bow. The gun is what puts it where it needs to go. So, like, that's – it's kind of what seals the deal. Yeah. Now, I can see the other side of the argument. Like, I know a lot of hunters, and and I respect these guys. They know they know their limit, and they don't want to shoot over two or 300 yards, whatever yeah. that is. And uh, at that point, you can probably get away with a super light rifle. Mm-hmm. But – I think people expect a little too much out of the equipment. Like they want to be able to have a eight or nine pound rifle and shoot and hunt at long range, you know, Mm -hmm. say past 600 yards. And they probably don't shoot a big enough sample size to really know their capability Yeah. or they're doing it comfortably from a bench or go only going out on nice days. And yeah, they're whacking stuff way out there, but when they they haven't gone to the field and done that like yeah if somebody told me like you know i've got a six pound rifle and my maximum range on animals 800 yards like you might be there might be someone that's that good like yeah. you might could do it a <laughs> kalen could probably do it there's very few people in the world that can do that consistently like yeah. in my opinion and this is just my opinion it might hurt some people's feelings but like if you think you can do that, like take your lightweight rifle to a match and, yeah. and then tell me what your max range is yeah, yeah. on animals. Yeah. So interesting. No, <laughs> I, it, I was just having a conversation with uh, someone about, you know, years of experience, right? Like what does that even mean? Mm-hmm. Right. So when someone says like, I've got 20 years of experience, mm-hmm. right. Do you have 20 years of experience doing that one thing yep. you know of of uh you know of that one experience that you have yeah, yeah right or you have 20 years of experience but your sample size of of actually shooting a rifle is 20 to 30 rounds a year right? yeah it's like yep. it's like hey you know not to toot my own horn but like i've shot you know i go to the range and shoot anywhere from 40 to 60 sometimes you know 100 rounds a day yeah right um one of the best uh, shooters in the world right now, uh, uh, Jake Millard. I mean, I think his dad just posted up a round count. Uh, he shot like 12,000 rounds last year. It's yeah. insane, right? Yep. And so like, um, it, you know, with that, like that repetition of like, of like doing it over and over and over again in, in high volumes. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I say that because like, you know, this, this kid is – one of the most talented shooters in the world right now, but he still misses shots, mm-hmm. right? Because, you know, it's, it's not like he's going to these matches and he's cleaning every course of fire, yeah. right? Yep. And so um, I, I think it's just important for guys that are, are hunters to, you know, like, again, put their ego aside and be like, hey, like, I don't know what I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that uh and, and i say this you know because assuming that the people that are listening I, I shouldn't say that i know the people that are listening to this the podcast obviously want to better themselves mm-hmm. so the people like I'm, I'm preaching the choir here right yeah yeah in terms of it's most, a certain group that's listening to the podcast yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like that, that they're that are already every, yeah. seeking higher yeah. levels, levels of education right but then yeah there's a the extra you know percentage and I think as I dive more into the hunting realm, because I'm yeah. no longer a sniper, uh-huh. like I want to be able to educate those hunters that, you know, um, buy a $10,000 rifle off the shelf, thinking that yeah. it's going to shoot for them. Yeah. When realistically, you know, yeah, the, the like you said, the, the rifle is the tool that gets, you know, that bullet to hit yeah, yeah. your animal. But ultimately, we're the driver. Yep. Right. Yeah, we're the 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 monkey pulling the trigger is the weak end of the system. That's right. That's yeah. right. And we, we talk about that all the time in, in, yeah. in the podcast and all of our in person classes. So yeah. Um, well, speaking of in person classes and and what you just said, it, it was awesome uh, last summer um, helping you out uh, when I could make it to the that hunting clinic. That was super cool. And and like you talked about, like the guys listening to this podcast and. The guys going to that class, like I didn't know really what to expect, like I, and it was really cool, like the mentality of of those guys that went there, and and like I thought it was super cool. Um, the one guy that it was his first bolt action rifle, wanted to get into hunting, and the first thing he did was sign up for a class. Mm-hmm. Like 
that was, that was pretty cool. I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, he, he had a 300 win mag. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. And every time he hit like a personal record. Yep. Because that was the first time that he had shot past like two or 300 yards. Yeah. Yeah. He would be like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's funny because like, you know, we shoot so much. We take stuff like that for granted. Yeah. Right. And, and like, I think that's the beauty of of the sport in general, yeah. right? Not just, just hunting aside, but like the sport of long range shooting of like, of like the satisfaction you get when you start touching yeah. and, and realizing what you're able to do with modern bullets and rifles, yeah. you know, um, with again, the right, right, uh, right tools and the right training, uh, to be yep. able to accomplish that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing with those guys training. Like I was kind of expecting, cause it's a quote unquote long range hunting clinic. Mm -hmm. I was kind of, expecting like a group of guys that wanted to shoot elk at 1200 yards yeah. you know like i want to buy a ten thousand dollar rifle take this class and go out and shoot an elk at 1200 yards and that wasn't it at all like like you guys have a good group of followers that are yeah. that want to come learn from you and yeah. i think everybody there it just i got the feeling that they want to hone their their skills and their already maximum range and there are yeah. some nrl hunter guys there that you know, we're probably trying to hone their skills for that yeah. as well. Um, but yeah, that was, that was super cool. And, uh, what was the other, we were on, we were talking about something. We were talking about your seven PRC. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and we went down a rabbit hole. Of yeah. No. So I think like that 13 pound, like, oh, yeah, I need, to, I need right to get my butt in shape and, uh, I need to, uh, I might take, I might do some stuff to it to get it to 11, 12 pounds, but I think that's a happy, happy hunting weight. Like I said, I was carrying around that 16 pound gun forever, but it was nice. Cause when I got like back then my limit was 600 yards and then I <laughs> learned much. I remember you saying something. I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta reevaluate my personal limit. And, uh, but oh, because, because I, at because the time, I, because I told you that my limit was my, my limit was 600. Yeah. I didn't know if you'd said that on a podcast. I didn't want to put it, your, your limit out. But you, when you said that, like the first time I met, I'm like, I knew your background and, and like the, at that time, like the year before you'd won the PRS finale. And I'm like, if his limit's 600 yards, I should probably reevaluate mine. But anyways, uh, back then before I knew what I know now, it, I carried around that 16 pound rifle, but I knew if I got within 600 yards of something, it was going to die. Like yeah. I had that confidence yeah. because it was fun to shoot. I could shoot it a lot. I actually practiced with it quite a bit for yeah. a 300 wind mag. Yeah. Um, but anyways, no, I'm really liking the PRC. It seems super forgiving as far as like, like I said, that, that load that averaged for four or five shot groups, 0.7, that was just a random. I had some 175 burgers laying around that I, wasn't going to use for anything else and uh just through a random powder charge random primer and it's shooting good uh before that i i think i had some 168 match kings too that i shot like the first 20 rounds and yeah it's just been attack driver with everything so cool i'm excited to actually yeah. work up a load for it uh so talk about your 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 circle of components again i know this uh, just okay. for our, yeah, yeah. our listeners um and i'll probably for this video for everyone that's watching I'll probably put some um, overlay of teasers of your of your okay. of your rifle build. But yeah. That I mean, we built that specifically for uh, our members, mm -hmm. um, uh, for the circle, the guys that have access to Circle Components Master Class, so they can um, see you know kind of why you built what you built. Yeah. Because right? yeah, everyone yeah. has different. It's like I, the way I look at it, it's like it's like ice cream. Yeah. You know yeah. I mean? Like. Everyone has their different flavors of ice cream that they love. Yep. And hey, this is a flavor of a rifle that you like based yeah. off of specific components. And I think that's something that I want to do for our our riflemen is like when we go to our in person classes, is like pull them aside and be like, hey, talk to me about your rifle build. Like, mm -hmm. why did you select the chassis? Why did you select yeah. this action, the barrel, so on and so forth? And I, I know a lot of it sometimes has, you know, outside influence, right? Because yeah. when you get into the sport, you usually usually you have um, that, you know, influence of the people you look up to, shooters or your mentors, and you're like, okay, I want to build what they build. And then ultimately, you know, it's a system that works for us because of our frame yeah. or our shooting style. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so it started off with a Remington 7 mag that was built by Snowy Mountain Rifle Company. And uh, I'd pulled the barrel on and off a couple times, uh, swapping that action with, uh, 
some different barrels. But long story short, I originally got it. Um, it was built by Snowy Mountain Rifle Company in 7 Mag. And it's a blueprinted Remington 700 action. Um, it's got a PTG bolt, Seiko style extractor instead of the Remington extractor. Uh, had a Remington extractor not work uh, during a hunting situation one time. And that kind of, it, it did it a couple times later in later years, it started showing up more and more while I was practicing with that rifle. But, uh, anyways, I really like the Seiko style extractor. It has a, the jewel trigger that came on it. Um, I'd like to switch that to trigger tech at some point, just cause the, my work rifle is a two stage trigger tech and I'm trying to make them, my rifles as consistent as possible as far as trigger, trigger weight, trigger pull, all that stuff. Um, KRG Bravo, uh, for the stock chassis. Um, I went with, uh, uh, getting ahead of myself. So action and then the barrel, um, I wanted to go carbon fiber and I tried to use another carbon fiber company in the past that I think was just getting started. I had some problems with it. You always, so, it's funny that you say that you always, <laughs> you always like bring that up because apparently it is definitely a sore spot for it's you. It's a very sore spot because every time, like, <laughs> every video that we've done with regard to your seven PRC, you always bring that up as a kind of like a, like a disclaimer, like, Hey, proof's not my first carbon fiber barrel that I've tried. And yeah. It's like, there's it's, this company that just like just, rubbed you the wrong way. Yeah. And I could have just, like I said, I think they were new, just getting started. Maybe hadn't figured it out yet, but it's kind of a sore spot, but don't get me started on LaRue. Will, will this be a two hour podcast? That sore spot. Anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, I went with proof because, you know, you shoot a bunch of proof barrels. I got buddies that have proof barrels that I haven't heard of anybody that's had a bad one. I'm sure they're out there like any other manufacturer, but I um, wanted to play it safe, so I went proof and a uh, 22-inch barrel um, to accommodate the suppressor. Like my 28 Nosler, for example, was supposed to be a 28 inch barrel but i screwed up the muzzle thread so i had to cut those off and mm -hmm. it ended up being a 27 inch barrel after i rethreaded it um so with the 22 inch barrel with my six inch can it ends up being a 28 inch the same thing as a 28 inch uh like the 28 nosler yeah. as far as length and whatnot um we'll attract optics uh it's a two and a half to 15 uh, by 44 and it's just got the features that I, I like in a hunting scope, locking turret, uh, well, locking elevation, capped wind turret, um, MOA. So I'm not saying MOA is better than Mills or even starting that, but uh, in when I'm hunting, I do like to use the reticle to measure, you know, the width of a deer, the length of a tine on an elk or something like that. And uh, that math just in my head is easier in minutes than taking – doing it in mills and converting 3.6 to however many mills I see, you know, whatever. So, um, for hunting, I like MOA and, uh, um, that's also just what I could afford at the time. It's, mm -hmm. it's a thousand dollar scope. And, uh, I figured I've got all year to use it before hunting season. So I'm going to beat the snot out of it. And if it's durable tracks accurately, I'll leave it on for hunting season. And, uh, if not, um, I'll switch to something else, but so far I'm actually really impressed for the price. Um, I like their business model; they're direct consu direct to consumer, so you don't get that huge thirty to fifty percent markup. Yeah. So I think it's a really quality optic for a thousand bucks. I've done a tracking test; I can't see any error in the tracking. Um, I'm not intentionally beating it up because I don't want to break it, but I'm also not babying it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how I am with equipment. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll uh, pull that. yeah, yeah. I put a big old dent and Phil let me use this Leopold, uh, Mark five this last hunt in the season. And I went to throw the rifle over my shoulder and missed the barrel and went over my back and landed right on the elevation turret on a, on the sharp edge of a rock took a chunk of metal out and but it held zero that's the best impressive. part of the fact that it held zero yeah i think that's i mean it's so important that in i mean it's very rare that i grab a scope and immediately beat the shit out of it right um i know sometimes that's needed to like instill confidence but like I, i'm not doing that with my, all my optics right yeah um i know sometimes my optics will have a spill yeah and that is when i ultimately like find out like 
whether it gives me confidence or not. And um, a, a few of my calluses that I have here, uh, you know, I've left the rifle kind of sitting in practice uh, on like a barricade and then it flips right over because yep. the wind or whatever lands right on top of the turret yep. and it's held zero, yep. you know, and um, just seeing that uh, because it is such a small package, lightweight, you know, um, the, the 3.618 uh, and, and, you know, not trying to say I had my doubts, but it just reassured me that I can now like, you know, recommend others that are wanting to get a you know yeah. rifle scope that is in that mid tier price range. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they can buy with confidence and know that if they're going to the field, yep. hey, this thing took a direct impact to the to the turret and held yep. zero. So, yeah, yeah, and that's kind of what the the tracked. Um, you know, I banged it against the side of the the truck when I was coyote hunting. I was pulling it out and it hit hard enough to take a little bit of metal off the magnification ring. It held zero after that, and then. Uh, it was after we did the video on it, but I had it leaned up against the truck and I was grabbing like the chronograph or ammo, whatever I was grabbing, it slipped over, landed on the elevation turret, shot it, held zero. So, so far it's good, but yeah, I definitely want that. Uh, it's going to have to prove itself through me, to me throughout the summer. Um, Cause yeah, it's kind of, for me, that's the biggest thing for a hunting scope, honestly, like glass, it's got to be good enough to see the animal have to, has to have decent low light, but it's a site it's that's what's it, its primary function is to allow me to hit what i'm aiming at mm -hmm. um and because it's hunting in field conditions you know can't tell you how many times i slip and fall during a hunting season uh it's likely to get beat up so durability is probably like the number one thing for me for uh, a hunting scope so yeah uh trying to hit the krg bravo got an atlas bipod on there i think that's pretty much it for the circle components on it cool cool <laughs> yeah no it's uh it's interesting because um you know 7prc again it's, it's fairly new uh it, there's a lot of buzz around it and mm. um i know that i want to build a 7pr this year this year i appreciate you gifting me uh the uh, uh remington 700 action yeah uh, i i already knew what i want to build with that yeah uh, and so but i just i just threw it up uh, on the the gram to see yeah. what everyone's feedback was, and I got a lot of interesting comments with regard to like what I should build. Yeah, but I'm gonna build a 300 wind mag out of it, right? Yeah, like yeah. 300 wind mag. Uh, military snipers still use it, at least the yeah. Marine snipers and in, in the Army, and um, there's some other units out there. And so I wanted again just be familiar with that cartridge uh, a little bit more uh, intimately um, for our uh, military clients. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I'll uh, build a 300 wind mag, very similar to probably a profile of um, what uh, the Marines use, yep. obviously because um, I'm biased, yeah. right? Um, Marines make the best snipers in the world. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, probably somewhere on the lines, but on a separate note, my second long action build this year, Magnum, will be a uh, 7 PRC. Heck yeah. And um, that will probably be my like dedicated, like big game elk hunter, yeah. right? Even though I've, I've made it possible that you can kill an elk with a 6.5 free more. <laughs> and I'm still, I'm still trying to do a video about that. Uh, I was there. The side of his rifle said 6.5 Creedmoor. It was actually a, a, a 2.64 wind yeah, mag. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. It was actually a 6.5. Six, six, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of that, I actually, I've listened to the first podcast I was on like 50 times. Really? Yeah. Not 50. Like probably six to 10. Yeah. And uh, so I wanted to clarify because I, I had said like people, I've heard people say they're buying a 6.5 Creedmoor to long range hunt elk. And it makes me sick. And I, I wanted to just give a little perspective of that. Like the 6.5 Creedmoor is not a bad hunting round at all. It's just people have told me they're doing, they're buying it specifically to long range elk hunt. So there's a difference there. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, you know, obviously 400 what was your elk at like four, 465 465 like it did the job i'm just saying like you, you can do it it's possible yeah <laughs> but not the best tool for long range no. elk hunting, it proceed with you know? caution like, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and you know one thing that again i've been wanting to do a video about this for the longest time um and 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 probably hopefully after this it'll motivate me to actually uh finish the script for it but um you know, I, I educate the 6.5 Creedmoor as a entry-level round 
um, for people to get into long range shooting that maybe have intentions of hunting in the future. Yeah, yeah. But knowing that like, hey, this rifle cartridge um, is capable of shooting an elk mm -hmm. as long as you understand its limitations mm -hmm. in terms of like not only the the uh, projectile itself the bullet that you're you're bringing to the fight yeah the animal that you're shooting but also your individual capability right because yeah. like you know uh, uh, a thing that again I, I i take for granted with that is like you know like i'm a competitive shooter mm -hmm. you know and you know i shoot 10 to 15 times more than the average shooter average hunter yeah and um as you saw as we all saw in the video that i posted like it took two shots to put him down maybe he would have gone down on that first shot right yeah. i sent the second one for security uh, but i also got lucky in the in the situation where he let me give him a second shot right yeah yeah and he, i mean you got a double lung so he he would have died but mm -hmm. like the amount of damage that was done to the lungs mm -hmm. so if we like uh i think kaylin did the terminal ballistics class in the network and yep. talks about this but like if you think about how animals die like you can do a headshot directly destroy the brain but for the for the most common hunting shot uh putting it through the the vitals you're trying to get it to bleed internally externally but to bleed out so oxygen doesn't make it to the brain so the quicker the elk bleeds out or the animal the quicker it dies and uh with that amount of damage it's just going to take longer to bleed yeah. out versus you know poking it with a, a seven mag or maybe a, a different bullet or a different whatever which that the, that's what honestly what i would hunt with in a 6.5 cream is the 143 ldx like i would have picked that same bullet but yeah bigger cartridge is just going to do more damage to those vitals so the animal bleeds out faster yeah um i was going somewhere else with that too where were you going with that i don't know Oh, you're talking about limitations of the cartridge. Yeah. So yeah, like limitations of the six five three. Honestly, even I talked a little bit about this in the last podcast, but even something I don't want to use the word wimpier, less whatever. So say a two forty three six cream more, yeah. basically a two forty two forty three ish. And that's actually a good. Uh, uh, I've been using this analogy with my friends that asked me why I went seven PRC, like kind of what it is. I'm like. It's kind of like a 243 Winchester and a six Creed. Yeah. Like, same bullet weights give you about the same velocity, but the six Creed's just a newer design, shorter, fatter case that allows you to see the bullet out longer. So the 7 PRC and 7 Mag, I think, actually kind of fit that pretty well. But so I know a bunch of people have shot elk with a 243, mm -hmm. um, but you got to know, like, the, how much the limitations of it. You yeah. know, if you're using, say, a... a What's the, uh, is it a 103 ELDX? Yeah. Like if you're using a 103 uh, ELDX. For the 6 what, Creed. Yeah, for the 6 Creed, what velocity does that bullet need to be going to do a bunch of damage? And then how how quickly do you expect the animal to die? And that yeah. kind of gets into morals and ethics and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, what you're writing a book about. <laughs> oh, did I, did Teaser. I, did, did I, did I, yeah, uh, it's all good. Tease that too early? Yeah, no, I'd act, uh, um, I got something coming, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah. Cause you know, I think a lot of people, you, you were talking about, that's kind of where I was going with it too, is knowing your, you were talking about people knowing their limitations with the cartridge. Yeah. So shooting enough to know that, like, cause I've seen a lot of people that, you know, they hit, they go out, hit a piece of steel at 800 yards or whatever. And they're like, yep, my rifle's dialed in for hunt season. And they think they're good to go to 800 yards. Well, when I'm watching the uh, piece of steel, like one specific incident that comes to mind, uh, that sheep that's out at, the, at, out at our range, is that's like 800 something, mm -hmm. isn't it? So this guy uh, shoots, hits the steel. I saw the impact on the, the butt of the sheep. Yeah. He's like, shoot, that'd be a dead elk. And I'm like, man, I had to, I had to, to I didn't say anything. I kept my mouth shut, but I'm like, that would have been a wounded elk because, <laughs> yeah, you hit the piece of steel, but that piece of steel is, like, what, that wide? Yeah. So, like... It's pretty big. Or it, it's a pretty big piece of steel, and yeah. he hit on the far left edge, and I'm like, that would have been a gut shot. Or maybe you missed that that amount in a different direction and got lucky and hit it in the head or somewhere you didn't mean to that does kill it quickly, but 
that shot specifically, I wanted to be like, man, if that was an elk, first off, that would have been a gut shot elk. Second off, it's going to take you two or three hours to walk that far. Yeah. Um, and by the time you get there, the elk's going to be in a different spot. And if you don't have a good blood trail, then you're going to have a harder time tracking it. Yeah. And uh, there's just a lot of little considerations to think about when hunting and, and kind of going back to what you said, like no matter what caliber, like – I would, I would honestly feel fine hunting with a six creed. Yeah. I would just have limits for elk, deer, antelope. The conditions would play a factor into that. Um, for me personally, I'd probably use a, a monolithic like Hornady CX yeah. or uh, a Barnes because yeah. I know it's going to penetrate if I hit the shoulder. Um, stuff like that. Like yeah. So that elk that we were looking at this year um, – he was like right at 600, I think, yeah. you know, and, but the way he was standing, um, people think about animals shooting animals from a broadside shot. Like when they're visualizing it in their head and how big the vitals are yeah, and yeah. stuff, they picture it like the pieces of steel that you'd find out on range. Well, yeah. in the field, animals present you with different angles, you yeah. know, and, and your elk was sitting there like just, he knew that his shoulder was like covering up his vitals as much as possible. Like it was just at a bad angle. And it's like, um, I remember thinking like, I don't know if that bullet's going to, going to make it through the shoulder. And I don't know if we talked about that before or after, but you know, that would have been a doable shot for you, your skill level under those conditions. Um, I think in that the limiting factor was daylight. So Mm -hmm. we were waiting for, for legal shooting light and the bullet, um, had that been a monolithic, you know, like you could have punched through the shoulder and, um, that thicker, muscle and and if you hit the bone uh that denser material is probably would have helped that monolithic bullet actually expand more and it probably would have done plenty of damage made it to the vitals and all that stuff um but yeah like from writing the book i've I've thought a lot about the the way people think about hunting and what caliber they're going to use and what um and yeah i think like when people are talking about the vital size of an animal I think they're picturing a broadside shot. Like if you printed out an elk on a piece of paper and made a target, that elk's probably broadside. And that's how people, their minds just think about that. Yeah. Where in the field, you got quartering two, quartering away, straight away. Uh, if you're going to do a Texas heart shot, you need a deep penetrating bullet <laughs> and, uh, or facing right at you. And, you know, um, yeah, there's just, a, there's just a ton of different variables yeah. when it comes to hunting, but. Cool. Yeah. yeah, no, I know I, you're, <laughs> you're, it's, it's, uh, you're very passionate about, uh, being a hunter, uh, first, right. Um, mm-hmm. rifleman second, I think that's, I can see it kind of turning tides <laughs> in terms of, you know, like you yeah. want to hone your skills as a rifleman more than, you know, just being able to, uh, be a, an effective hunter, but that always keeps you grounded in terms of like, Hey, like at the end of the day my skills that I learned to become a better rifleman are ultimately going to allow me to be a better hunter. Yeah. Yeah. Better and a better sniper. Right. Yeah. And so um, I, I, uh, I applaud you for that because again, it's very rare uh, to, to find individuals that have that, um, that push, right. Because, you know, being surrounded in the military for 11 years and seeing, a lot of snipers potential go to waste mm-hmm. once they achieve, you know, the status quo or achieve, you know, that graduation certificate, the title, right? they think yeah. that like now, you know, they can walk on water yeah. when, when in reality, you know, uh, they're just not as good as you, they think they are or they're not yeah. as good. Yeah. They're not as good as they think they are. And, and, um, one thing I wanted to ask you to kind of wrap up the podcast, uh, for this hour that we've been on, um, is, what advice would you give a new um, hunter that's wanting to get into like backcountry hunting, like Wyoming yeah. hunting, specifically with regard to um, riflemanship skills? Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of advice would you give them with with like training, with gear, uh, or rifle selection yeah. um, to help better educate them or their purchase? You know, because I get the question asked a lot. I still have like an imposter syndrome with when it comes to like giving advice uh, for hunting because I'm still, I feel like I'm still trying to get my feet wet with how 
everything works, right? Just because yeah. I've killed an elk doesn't mean that, like... Well, you, you killed know, more than just an elk. Yeah, I, yeah, I was, But I was actually going to get to say this earlier, because uh, you're kind of harder on yourself when it comes to that, which I admire, because, like, some people will do something once and think they're an expert. Yeah. So I admire that about you, but when you were talking about, uh, you know, one year of experience over 20 years versus 20 years of experience in a year... Um, just the backcountry hunting that you've done. Like I know a lot of people that grew up around here and have killed more elk than me, uh, that have, that don't have the, the, the type of hunting we're talking about, you have more experience than they do. Yeah. They've been doing it their whole life. Um, it kind of depends on what the, the listener how they measure experience. Cause yeah. if it's, if it's, That's you know, number of elk, how, but how to measure experience. That's yeah. It. Cause I've like, never thought about that. Well, there's like a lot of people that shoot elk out of a field every year that. The, the, well, that's what I'm saying is like the question that you asked me is, it's kind of hard. Cause so for someone, there's so many different variables cause people hunt different. Like the people that, uh, like I know people have killed a large number of animals, but like, half of them were they drove the truck up yeah. to the edge of a field yeah. and waited for daylight yeah. and hopped out and shot it yeah. at 200 yards it's yeah. completely different than the backcountry hunting like yeah. you're talking about you know and uh um, you mean the hunting that we did this last last uh fall and <laughs> only saw one elk yeah <laughs> which was the first 15 minutes of our hike <laughs> yep it was a rough year yeah yeah no this uh i should have thought about that too that we'd had Ryan's mule, uh, we could have could have gone a lot back back okay. further with that, but well, no, we I, planned I, I, on having a bunch of bunch of guys to where we could get to where the elk were, but yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. schedules and crap. Uh, so anyways. I would say that I guess the 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 person that is asking you, and I say this because after this was again 2021 when I did shoot my elk, uh-huh. uh, and I posted those series of videos. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone enjoyed that. Everyone yeah, enjoyed yeah. to see kind of like the behind the scenes of like leading up to the shot, right? That whole kind of guided experience that you gave me mm-hmm. uh, because people pay for that, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, that's something that you grew up doing. Yeah. And and so like someone that wants to get in that type of hunting. Okay. Where it's like, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm jumping on a horse. I'm going back yeah. into the, the wilderness. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to live like <laughs> Jeremiah Johnson. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so for that, uh, with horses, I would recommend um, finding a – depends on if you already have a full-time job or not, I guess, too. But, like, so I got into I, – I grew up with it as part of my lifestyle, mm-hmm. so it, it was just kind of natural. And then, you know, worked for an outfitter in the summertime and stuff. But if you – have the time to go work for like a trail ride place. Like we've got a lot of guest ranches around here that take people on trail rides just to learn horses. Um, and then from there, maybe talking to an outfitter, um, and seeing offering to like, Hey, I know how to, at that point, you know how to saddle a horse, ride it, be safe around horses, all that stuff, but you might not know the packing or keeping a horse alive in the backcountry because that's a completely separate skill. Um, but once you're comfortable around horses, you could ask an outfitter like, hey, uh, can I come along with you on a pack trip or a, a backcountry hunt and basically work for free um, because the experience that you'll get working for the outfitter, they're going to teach you how to keep animals alive in the backcountry. They're going to tell you um, – what causes wrecks in the mountains and it, it's simple stuff like that. I mean, I, I have friends that rodeo and they have way more time on a horse's back than I do. Uh, but you watch them saddle their horse and they want the pads, the saddle pads kind of centered. Um, the back country, when you're not just on the horse for 30 seconds to go rope or whatever you're doing, um, pads will slide backwards Um, I've never seen pads slide out the front. So for, that's just an example of like little mountain being with horses in the mountains is different. So we always put our pads all the way forward to where the back of the pad is lined up with the back of the saddle. Yeah. So that slacks up front. Um, 
and then yeah like you need to know how to you don't need to be good at it but you you need to know you need to be good enough at shoeing a horse being able to if they throw a shoe uh be able to put a new one on without hurting it um because you can do some damage to their feet with the you put a nail in the wrong spot um just little things like that and if you offer to go with the an outfitter like the knowledge you're going to get from that a lot of people i think have a hard time working for free but you would pay a lot for that knowledge, yeah. you know? Yeah. So offering to work for an outfitter for free, um, the horse thing aside, um, say you don't, don't want to do the horses, but you want to do that style of backcountry hunting. Yeah. I would say I'll start off with the rifleman, uh, part of it, doing a competition that's uh, field style, you know, mm-hmm. PRS, if, if you can't make it to a national match, like I still haven't been to one, but we've got a, a local club, um, I've done a couple matches there and just get out of your comfort zone with shooting. Um, I have a lot of hunter friends that are like, you know, have their maximum limit or whatever. And they're, they're like, well, I know I'm, I'm only going to do this in the, the prone. So they don't, they don't practice positional, but I hear stories from people with that mentality of they see a buck at 200 yards and try to take a shot off a tree branch. Um, they've never practiced shooting standing before. Yeah. And, you know, you know, you would think within 200 yards it wouldn't matter, but it does. Yeah. Like, I've wounded a black bear. Uh, I'm going to save that for the book. Got to buy the book when it comes, comes out. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so from the shooting thing, get out of your comfort zone. Try to go to a local PRS-style match um, is what I would recommend for that. And then uh, get out and hike. You know, talk to friends that hunt and um, – Go out and have fun. Like, I think a lot of people spend too much time researching, like, what gear. You know, I, I see people run into people in the mountains that are decked out head to toe with, like, their clothes, like, were, are more expensive than, like, all the gear I'm carrying, just their clothing. Their clothes are more but expensive they, than their training. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the $10,000 rifle doesn't make a $10,000 shooter. Mm-hmm. Your backpack, your clothing, your all this stuff. Like, I grew up hunting in blue jeans, car hearts, and anyways, isn't going to make you a better hunter. Like, go out where you're, you you think you're going to be hunting and just track track animals. Like, practice, like, doesn't have to be an elk or deer. Like, yeah. go find a set of tracks. Try to follow it. Um, just go out and glass. Like, uh, learn animal movement. Like, how they, where they like to be in the morning, afternoon, stuff like that. And, uh getting out in the mountains it doesn't have to be hunting season i guess that that's the advice i can come up with right off the top of my head (laughs) no worries no i i figured i'd ask and um i think it's it's all it's all valuable advice you know i think um as i I, as i dive more into the uh hunting industry and the community Mm -hmm. like you said everyone has their different styles of of hunting just like shooting and you know i remember coming off of our hunt in the backcountry in 2021, and then March of 2022 was my was my next hunt, which was yeah. an odd ad hunt in Texas. Yeah, it was high fence, right? And yeah. I was like, "Holy crap!" From one extreme <laughs> to another, where I was like, yeah. you know, like my idea of hunting was always that backcountry style, um, you know, throwing stuff that you have for three to four days of survival on your back, and you're not coming out of the mountains until yeah. you have, you know, uh, antlers. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, meat yep. on, on your back. And so, um, I think, uh, again, it's interesting coming from, uh, someone that is, is born and raised in the mountains uh, out here in Wyoming. And again, that has, has adopted or shifted his mindset of like, of like, Hey, you know, yeah, I've have, um, X amount of years of hunting experience, but I don't have that much shooting experience yep. in terms of like shooting the way, that maybe I shoot or Kalen shoots and that mm-hmm. allowed you to like take a look at your ego and be like, Hey, yeah. like I can learn yeah. from this to make myself a better hunter, yep. but also educate those because I, I can see a little part of you that is interested in educating yeah. others. Right. Um, yep. And that, that's something that we've talked about is, is refining your um, teaching style. Yeah. Right. And, and just getting comfortable, like doing podcasts like these and, yeah. and being able to, because you have a lot of knowledge, right? You're very passionate about a subject, and when Thanks. when uh, 
there's not a camera in your face <laughs> and you have another person to talk to you. Yeah. You have a very, you, yeah, that camera's off to the side. You so. have uh, you have really good delivery. So, <laughs> well, thanks. Um, yeah, no, I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of this year, seeing your journey uh, as a rifleman and a hunter. Uh, I know we've got a lot of cool things and projects uh, on the military law enforcement sniper side that we want to do project wise yeah. together. Uh, but I, I'm uh, looking forward to helping you achieve your goals uh, by, you know, December 31st of 2023 with shooting an NRL hunter, uh, just being mm -hmm. a more proficient with uh, with your riflemanship skills and your yep. loading, you know, like, you know, yeah. hopefully being able to uh, maybe even shoot an F class match together yeah. uh, with, you know, our rifles to see who had who had better mm -hmm. reloading. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. Yeah. No, that'd be sweet. And, and like you said, uh, you know, with the, I hadn't thought about it this way, but it's cool that you saw that that way that I'm like, I'm a hunter and then, you know, I'm willing to go to a match and get my butt kicked to see where I can improve and learn. Um, but shooter second, like that brings me to how I think about it. It's kind of back to the, the rifles, what put, puts it all together, like at the end of the hunt. Mm -hmm. And I wish people would, you know, take a class, learn their capabilities and try to become a better shooter, not to extend their range. Like I wish instead of long range hunting, it was called precision hunting. Yeah. You know, like, way. like, cause for me, you know, I've got this technology now that could allow me to shoot animals way further. I'd rather use it to make a more, a cleaner, quicker kill yeah. and be more educated on my bullet and cartridge and, and put that animal down as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, and again, that's moral ethical thing, but, uh, so not everybody's going to agree with that, but that's kind of how I look at it. And I wish, you know, people would, instead of thinking, okay, I can hit thinking of the broad side, say an antelope and thinking, you know, vitals 12 to 14 inches wide by this tall. Okay. I hit a piece of steel at this distance. So I'm good to shoot that animal at that yeah. distance. It's like, I'm going to stick with my distance, but I want my skill to be better so I can hit the center of those vitals, yeah. you know, like right where I'm aiming. I want to take the, I like eating the heart. So like, I would, I mean, my perfect shot would be slightly quartering two or quartering away where I can, uh, take the ventricles off the top of the heart, but not ruin the meat and then blow up both lungs. There you go. And I want to put the bullet right there instead yep. of just hitting in this general area yeah. that it's called the vitals. Placing you know? the bullet with intention. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And that, and that's the thing, like that, you know, like I strive for, like my distances now, mm. right? It's like it's not just like it's like, hey, at a thousand yards, you got a ten inch plate to work with. Yeah. No, like at a thousand yards, I want to put that bullet exactly where I meant it to go. Yep. Right. Yep. And and thread that needle as as thick as my crosshair that I'm looking or my reticle. It, it, you know, allows me to, yeah, yeah. right? And so um, that, I think, really defines the level of precision that, that you say. And I, th I, I think that's right. Like, I think, you know, that should be redefined as precision hunting, you know, not yeah. long-range hunting. So Yeah, yeah. Like knowing, hey, I've got this bullet. It's probably not going to go through the bones. I know the bones right here. I know this is where the front of the lungs sit. So I'm going to try to put the bullet, like, two inches behind that crease, little over halfway up, you know, wherever, you know, an animal yeah. standing a certain way. Okay. I know the bones are here. So I want to put the bullet three inches to the left of this bone and that should get it right at the top of the heart yeah. or whatever, you know? Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well, uh, dude, this was awesome. Good, good podcast. I appreciate yeah, your help thanks. today, but thank before you. the podcast, uh, uh, Clayton, um, offered his services and I couldn't take it up on him. Um, but it is, uh, he helped me prep my six, five forty seven brass. Um, because I've just been too preoccupied with creating content and all these other, you know, behind the, uh, uh, scenes that we do at modern day sniper. Uh, but I'm excited to hopefully do more of these, um, video podcasts. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. It's our first one. Sorry about all the, uh, external distractions like my dog barking. Uh, but yeah. Uh, thanks for, uh, taking your time. You're going to see oh, more Clayton you. because oh. he's not only a, a good friend of mine, but he's here in Cody. So um i enjoy it we have a lot of these talks uh clayton can can talk your ear off um <laughs> but uh if you're looking I, I, I don't mean to plug this um but i'm going to because we don't have ads on our on our uh podcast anyways and it's at the end of the podcast so uh we do have in-person classes for the 2023 schedule we plan on doing more 
um, uh, long range hunter mm -hmm. uh, clinic slash classes, which are three uh, day, day packages. Um, and I know that uh, Clayton will be involved in those. Uh, he, I tasked him out to be my terminal ballistics expert. Um, so he will, uh, his schedule pending, he'll be there to assist in classes. Uh, so those will be in Cody in the uh, July, August timeframe. So um, if you haven't looked at our schedule, uh, take a look at it uh, because it is up. And if they're not, our schedule will be ironed out by February at the end of this month um, of all the classes that we'll have throughout the summer. So cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for, the, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me and uh, hope to see you guys at some of those classes. It'd be cool. Yeah. I'll have the PRC there. Yeah, there you go. So, all right guys. <laughs> uh, appreciate you guys listening. Appreciate you guys watching and you guys know the drill. Keep your face on the gun. Peace.